Right, so I'm going to be covering uh, PCC responsibilities uh, for giving and fundraising uh, uh, in this session. Now, I, I ask forgiveness uh, straight away. Uh, in these slides are very detailed. I've done them deliberately so you can take them away almost as a handout. So um, uh, some of them are quite dense in terms of content, but that was a, a deliberate decision on my part. Uh, to help you going forwards. Now, the first thing that I just want to cover is what are trustees' responsibilities? And the reason for asking that question and to go through some of the Charity Commission guidance around trustees' responsibilities is that many of our PCC members are, are completely unaware that they are charity trustees. Uh, that's the that's the thing that they're unaware of. They think that they're just sitting on a church committee uh, and that is it. So please be aware that people are charity trustees on PCC committees. You are responsible as a PCC member for ensuring that your charity's purposes, your charitable purposes are for the public benefit, that you're complying with its governing documents, and uh, uh, charity law, and you're acting in your charity's best interests, using its resources responsibly, and acting with reasonable, I think that's key, reasonable care and skill. We're not expecting people to be complete legal experts, professional officers, it's reasonable care and skill. And overall, making sure that your charity, your church charity is accountable. Now, Those purposes, those charitable purposes, are for the public benefit. That's the thing that underpins all charitable law, is about charitable purposes being for the public benefit. So there will be specific purposes your charity is being set up, your church charity is being set up to deliver, and uh, no others. So this means that you need to understand what that is, how it's set out in your governing document, and plan what your charity will do and what it wants to achieve based on that. Um, you need to be able to explain how all of the charity's activities further will support its purposes and how the charity benefits the public, the public benefit by carrying out those purposes. Now, any expenditure, any monies that you receive, uh, if that is for the wrong purposes, you're not spending it to deliver those charitable purposes, then that could result in you as trustees having to reimburse that money personally. So it's well worth making sure that you've got that clear understanding of what you're doing and how you're doing it. The second bit that I'm going to just show you is about the charity's governing, governing document and the law. Uh, complying with its governing document but also complying with wider charity laws and other laws that apply to your charity. For example, HMRC requirements uh, 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 around gift aid claiming is a good example. Safeguarding is another one. So taking reasonable steps to find out what those legal requirements are. And as I say, just to reiterate, reasonable steps and where required to take uh, advice and guidance now, whether that is seeking advice from uh, uh, from uh, your diocese, whether that is uh, uh, taking advice from uh, the Charity Commission or from uh, 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 a lawyer, a solicitor, or from the fundraising regulator, uh, that could be something that you might need to do. But underpinning all of this is you must act in your charities, your church charity's best interests in carrying out its purposes but also about how you make balanced and informed decisions. And in making those decisions, that they're for the long term as well as for the, for the short term. So this isn't just about uh, paying money now, but have you got enough money to keep yourself solvent uh, and be, for you to be able to wash its face as an organisation into the longer term, which would be the issues in terms of cost of living uh, and, and other things going forwards. Uh, is that is going to become ever more important. Now, some of you may have uh, conflicts of interest. For example, um, 
I've been a church warden and been on a PCC committee at my local church. I have a conflict of interest as a diocesan officer. Um, so when it came to discussions around parish uh, share, uh, I uh, uh, withdrew myself from the discussions unless asked to comment about things connected to the diocese. And I didn't vote when it came to vote about what we could afford to give in terms of parish share. That is a conflict of interest. So you must declare those uh, uh, before the meeting or declare those before the item is discussed. That also appear, uh, applies to any uh, uh, people who you're connected to, um, uh, financially connected to, whether that is a partner, uh, a child or business partner. So for example, if your church is planning to undertake building work and you've got a friend, uh, you're, you, you're, you run a building company, or a, 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 a child, uh, a, a, a child uh, or grandchild has their own building company or works for a building company, and you want them to get them work to get the work, then that's a conflict of interest. You need to declare that clearly so that that doesn't affect your judgment uh, and uh, uh, as as your role as a charity trustee. Now, managing your resources responsibly, that's all about, as it says at the top of there. Uh, Responsibly, reasonably, honestly, being prudent, and you have a duty of prudence. So that making sure that any assets are used to support out the charity's work and its purposes, you're not exposing the charity to any undue risk or its beneficiaries or its assets. So the buildings, if you're using the building for a, a fundraising event or activity, um, that you're not putting uh, uh, anybody under undue risk, you're not overcommitting it. So if you're buying in um, an external organization's expertise, can you afford to do that? You know, if things didn't go as, as well as you expected, could you afford to do that and cover those costs? Taking care when investing or borrowing, investing, fantastic workshop, I think this morning, if I remember correctly, uh, from Heather Lamont from CCLA. So go back and watch that if you need help uh, and, and, and advice around those areas. But also comply with any restrictions on spending any funds, particularly restricted funds, and selling land. Often land is donated, um, or the buildings we occupy are donated to us with specific restrictions in place uh, as a charitable donation. If you want to sell those or use them for something else, you often may uh, uh, have a requirement to go and seek advice from the Charity Commission to maybe sell that building and use the monies for a different charitable uh, uh, purpose. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Make sure that you've got procedures and safeguards in, in, in place so that you are not vulnerable to any theft or abuse in any form. That includes the people who you are delegating responsibilities to, who were running events and activities, who were counting and banking monies on your behalf. That is your responsibility as well. In being accountable, churches on the whole are very good in, uh, obviously they produce their uh, uh, annual uh, parish returns. They do their annual reports and accounts. But that isn't just for an internal use. Make sure that that is visible. Put it on your website. Put it in your church near you page, so that you can um, you can um, uh, share. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking to the slide ahead of me. Um, in terms of doing that, apologies. Uh, you're acting with reasonable care and skill. Uh, so make sure that you're taking appropriate care. Reasonable. I keep coming back to that phrase. Reasonable care and skill. Uh, when uh, take advice, give enough time, thought and energy to your role. So if you miss a meeting, make sure you catch up with any materials or information you've missed and spend sufficient time before you attend a meeting reading anything that's provided for you so you can make an informed decision. Now, onto the slide I was going to talk about, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, um, accountability. Uh, Annual parish returns, I mentioned, annual parish uh, accounts uh, 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 and annual report, make them visible. 
that demonstrates that you are complying with the law and you're well run and effective. Uh, but you know, you also uh, need to make sure within those areas that you have an accountability to your members. And in terms of members, that isn't just your 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 church congregation, as I mentioned earlier on, people in your community are your parishioners. And uh, in terms of any delegations of responsibilities, make sure that people are properly accountable for those. So to, if people are delegated to do specific tasks, whether that's organising a fundraising event, counting and banking monies, do they know who they're responsible to? Which member of the PCC do they report back to, to raise issues, concerns, etc.? Now, you need to be eligible as a trustee. So that means you need to be at least 16 years of age. Uh, you need to be properly appointed uh, to follow uh, the procedures and, uh, of, uh, within the charity's governing document. We do that well within churches because of how our officers uh, are particularly uh, appointed. Church wardens is a classic example. Uh, but you mustn't act as a trustee if you're disqualified. So if you are disqualified, uh, that means that you are undischarged, bankrupt. You've got an individual voluntary arrangement. You might have unspent convictions for certain offences, or you are on the sex, sex offenders register. That means that you are uh, ineligible to be a trustee and to sit on the uh, PCC. In addition to that, it's also recommended that you do uh, a fit and proper persons uh, 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 test. So to check whether your PCCs are eligible to serve as charity trustees, this fits under the charity commission guidance, but also under HMRC guidance. If your gift aid secretary isn't a PCC member, we recommend that you do that as well. And in terms of how frequently to do this, any new PCC members should be uh, completing these forms. Any PCC members whose term of office has ended and they rejoin the PCC, again, make sure that they do that at that time as well. There is a hyperlink there, and I share that again at the end of the slide, where in parish resources, there's some guidance around trusteeship and a, a, a downloadable uh, uh, fit and proper person's form as well. As we move forward into the responsibilities for fundraising and in the broadest sense giving, we've come back to that point again about acting in the best interests of your organisation and that you are responsible for that area of giving and fundraising. And, you know, you have several basic responsibilities related to fundraising. And this is where we come on to the work of the fundraising regulator and its fundraising code. Now, the fundraising code has uh, a number of sort of uh, uh, main elements to it, which are listed uh, on the screen that I'm going to be going over over the next few slides. So first of all, what is the fundraising code? It sets out the responsibilities that apply to charitable uh, organisations and any third party fundraisers, whether they be paid fundraisers or volunteer fundraisers. Uh, and that is about maintaining a high standard of fundraising. Over a number of years ago, which led to the formation of the fundraising regulator, there were regular complaints about particularly the national charities around how they were doing fundraising, direct mail, uh, abusing uh, data protection, GDPR, etc. And that's the reason why it came in. So it's important that those standards are maintained even at our level uh, of small charities. So we need to make sure, therefore, that what is expected of us uh, to, to set out the standards that we need to use if we do receive complaints and church charities have received complaints around this, and these have then been raised by, at the fundraising regulator level. We provide uh, um, um, an opportunity for charities, 
and fundraisers to assess best practice against others so that the fundraising regulator can provide necessary training and monitoring. Uh, we also need to develop openness and honesty. This is very similar to the issues that we've gone through around safeguarding more broadly. This is the same thing when it comes to fundraising and the fundraising code. Now the code has three main elements, fundraising, all fundraising, so the behaviors, the dealing with personal data, how we process donations, how we work with others, including our volunteers, and how we fundraise with children and with vulnerable people, and then specific fundraising methods. So collecting money in our church buildings, uh, digital uh, donations, uh, uh, lotteries and competitions. So classic example that I always raise at this point is if you are doing a, a, a raffling church and you're using lottery, uh, sorry, uh, cloakroom tickets, and you're running that over a, a few days or a week, that is in breach of uh, lottery and gambling commission guidance and law. You need to get printed tickets and get a license, a small lottery's license uh, from your local authority. Uh, if you're drawing the, the raffle on the day using uh, uh, cloakroom tickets, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, it's something you need to go into and make sure you're aware of the restrictions uh, and the guidance that is in place. Your general duties connected to this. Some of these reflect back into the wider duties of charity trustees. Um, that, but the key thing is, if you're delegating responsibility to other people, it's still your overall responsibility at PCC level as trustees. So you may delegate things down uh, for, uh, to people outside of the PCC to take uh, this uh, forward, but the overall responsibility is still yours. Uh, you must, again, act in the best interests of it, avoid conflicts of interest, and make sure that any uh, charitable assets and resources are used for the purpose that they are given, and it's in line with the governing document. Now, we come back again to the use of the phrase to act reasonably and carefully. Now, as it says there, you're not experts in fundraising. So take appropriate advice, whether that's from the diocese, whether that is from organisations like the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, uh, from the National Giving Team in the Church of England, Charity Commission or from the Fundraising Regulator, lots of help and advice out there. And make sure that people uh, are clear that you're going to be receiving all of the money. And if you're working in partner partnership with uh, 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 local organisations or, or even bigger regional, national organisations, make sure that you do due diligence about them. What you don't want to be done is if you're working with somebody and then all of a sudden somebody highlights something to you that you weren't aware of beforehand, uh, and it comes back essentially to bite you on the bum. To manage this, risk, risk assessments, we all became very familiar with risk assessments during the pandemic to mitigate and, uh, and alleviate risks to our organisations. The same applies here. So, you know, make sure that you're taking reasonable steps to manage the risks. When you've got that recorded and documented, then that protects you and protects your church. Proceeds of Crime Act, uh, uh, sometimes, particularly for larger donations, uh, uh, sometimes things get highlighted by banks or building societies uh, uh, you know, around uh, uh, where that money's come from and was it generated through a, a, a legal behaviour. You have also got legal obligations to protect the health and safety of uh, your volunteers, your clergy, um, and anybody else who might be affected by uh, any fundraising activities. So if you're planning a fundraising event, whether that's inside the building, in the churchyard, in the parish hall, make sure you've done your risk assessments to make sure. We've all heard of, again, highly, very rare, uh, but you know things like, you know, uh, Bounty Castle has been blown away, just as an example of things that have happened at some public events in recent years. Make sure that you've 
made sure that you've uh, completed your risk assessments connected to those sort of activities. You are allowed uh, to accept uh, uh, and refuse and return donations. You must, must, mustn't refuse to do that, except in exceptional circumstances. If you decide to refuse a donation, make sure that you've got a full record of any decisions uh, that you make and the reasons for it. So you may think, actually, uh, you know, if you haven't got a, uh, a charitable acceptance uh, ref uh, refunding policy procedure, adopt one. So um, uh, earlier on in my previous uh, uh, workshop, a person asked around the acceptance of donations from national lottery or from gambling. Again, you might want to include that. I know looking at bigger national charities, some of the medical research charities, cancer charities, uh, uh, won't accept donations from, for example, alcohol companies, because alcohol is linked to uh, uh, causing cancer in certain circumstances. So make sure that that is in line with your policies and procedures. And if you're unsure, uh, consider getting legal advice. Uh, if somebody does ask for a refund, then um, uh, uh, that is possible to do. But I'll come on to uh, uh, some other considerations ab about refunds a, a little bit later on, about protecting yourselves from fraud. Any complaints about fundraising? In a similar way to safeguarding, make sure that you have a, a complaints procedure um, make sure that you can explain to uh, members of the congregation and also wider members of the public in your local community how they can make a complaint. Uh, they need to be properly investigated without unnecessary delay, but be proportionate to the, the, the type of complaint. Um, review any lessons learned uh, uh, and help that to plan future activities. You also need to uh, make sure that uh, you've got clear procedures for members of staff and volunteers to raise any concerns about your fundraising and giving practices. That should also include a whistleblowing policy so people can do that anonymously. And uh, uh, just be aware that as well that um, if you don't handle these sort of things well, it's rare, but it is possible for people to take this and raise these issues directly with the fundraising regulator. This has happened. Uh, there have been relatively minor issues and they've been resolved uh, uh, quite quickly, but the fundraising regulator has issued a judgment on these issues for some small numbers of church charities. Using your funds that you, you raise, we go back to again about using the funds for a particular cause for the cause that you, you are, your charity. Um, they, if the donor sets any conditions, uh, then you need to respect those, or if you've done that by accident. So for example, if you're setting up a fundraising appeal and you are saying that that is gonna be used for a specific purpose, when I used to do this with my fundraising leaflets, uh, working for charities, we had a little catch-all somewhere on the promotional materials to say that if the fundraising target was reached, then those excess monies would be used to support the general purposes of that organisation. So avoid the use of putting monies into restricted funds. Use designated funds. Because if, you, uh, if there is a condition against that donation and you haven't done that catch-all, if you don't have that in place and that, that those donations have been raised recently, you'll have to go back to the donors and ask for their permission to use that money for a different charitable purpose. If that was historic donations and it's been got a restriction against those donations, then you will have to seek permission from the Charity Commission to use those monies, use those assets, use those buildings, any sales. Uh, you'll have to get permission to do that. So. Keeping accurate records is key uh, and uh, make sure uh, as, as, as well that 
if you are doing any fundraising events and activities, you also make sure that you are setting that up to gain uh, maximum benefits from tax efficient giving. So, for example, uh, looking at down the right hand side of the screen, fundraising and events and activities and gift aid benefits. Churches and other charities uh, often do buy a brick or buy an organ pipe, buy a, buy a flagstone uh, type appeals. Now, there are, there are, there's obviously something that's been bought as part and parcel of that. And they are getting benefits from that in terms of sometimes having names either uh, etched directly into that item or their name attached to it in a sort of like more sort of nominal manner. If you're doing that, you need to set it up in a proper way to make sure that you can claim uh, um, uh, gift aid legally. And we've done this with other churches where sometimes we've managed to unpick issues to maximise gift aid uh, and, and, and go back to contact donors. So that's done properly. We have got guidance and we've got some exemplar materials that you can use for those purposes. But ask for help, please. In terms of processing your donations, hopefully this will be common practice in churches. About any monies received, that the cash isn't left unattended, it's counted and stored in a secure place, it's counted and recorded by two unrelated people where possible, and where that has been counted and it's not possible to bank it immediately, that you store that in a secure place, hopefully in the safe. Um, have a procedure for banking the donations. Who does it and when? And the bottom bullet point on the left-hand side, this has been a long-term issue for us. We've seen, tried to get advice from uh, HMRC on this because banks and building societies, post office counters, uh, very often won't accept part bags of coin. So if you're trying to bank monies where it matches exactly, as it says there, to the amounts that you've received, sometimes that's really difficult because it doesn't match back to the paying in slip. Now, what we've advised for a number of years now, and HMRC haven't objected to this, is that you record those monies uh, on your vesture sheet or something similar, where you have like a brought forward, carried forward total. So although you've got an accurate record of what was received by uh, that uh, event, that service, when it comes to banking, that could look a little bit different because of the difficulties of paying in part bags of coinage. So carry forward, bought forward is, I think, the best solution in terms of doing that. Um, uh, you know, Make sure that you don't give change in return for checks or issue refunds for check donation unless that has cleared. Make sure that uh, if you are uh, uh, issuing a refund, you wait until the check is cleared at the bank, just in case there's any fraud involved. And for any online donations or any other external partner, look for any relevant industry standards. Do they meet them? So for example, for online donations, there are industry standard security uh, protocols that need to be adapted and used. And if you are receiving online donations or contactless donations, you may be charged for transferring those payments back to you. That's fine. It's the equivalent of buying a box of envelopes. It's still a transaction fee. However, you must record the total amount as income. In recording that total amount as income, you also claim gift aid and GADs as eligible on that total amount received, but the transaction fees are recorded as an expenditure. So important that you do that correctly in your accounts. Now we're in the home straight now. You'll be pleased to you'll be pleased to know. I've deliberately used the uh, slide if you were uh, if you were at Jonathan de Bernard's uh, keynote address this morning. He used this lovely quote from Saint Anselm. Uh, and this relates really well, I think, into the issues around safeguarding and giving and fundraising, about how much of ourselves can we give? 
and how much of our, our uh, monetary donations, our monetary assets can we donate? Now, there have been safeguarding incidents connected to giving and fundraising in the Church of England, including within my diocese, where we've dealt with this and raised this with the National Church Giving Team. This is particularly around areas, for example, with donors who have been attending the same church for their whole life, their parents, their grandparents attended that church, and they often want to give more and more to keep their church buildings open. Sometimes that then results in them not having sufficient monies to look after themselves in terms of keeping themselves uh, uh, safe, whether that be food, heating, uh, 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 clothing, etc., uh, all those sort of different things. So they put themselves at risk. Now, quite rightly, there's a high level of confidentiality around safeguarding incidences. But there's also a high level of confidentiality around giving in churches and how that is shared. Now, what we need to do in our churches is, is, is create, I think, a, a closer relationship between the safeguarding officer and the gift aid secretary and or treasurer around these areas so that if we do notice these sort of issues and concerns then these things can be um, uh, sort of you know tackled and uh, avoided in terms of this coming into a, a proper safeguarding uh, issue now there is guidance from the church of england on this and that is going to appear on the next slide but if this happens at your church, then obviously raise it with the diocese and safeguarding officer, uh, uh, because it is a genuine safeguarding incident that we all need to be aware of. And I think increasingly, uh, this will this could be happening more and more. So useful resources, lots of hyperlinks on here that you'll see on the slides uh, eventually when you've got access to them. Now, the Charity Commission, they have an, an essential trustee document. They also have a charity trustee welcome pack. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, it was documents like that, alongside annual reports and accounts, meeting uh, minutes, uh, 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 et cetera, that I used to give as part of an induction pack to all of my new trustees that came on to my charity board. I used to meet with them to uh, have a conversation and reassure them uh, around uh, these issues and ask, a, ask any questions that they may have. And it's important to highlight that there is no such thing as a stupid question. If they don't know the answer, then they need, to, uh, they need that information. The Charity Commission also has its own YouTube channel with some nice little short videos of 10 to 15 minutes long. The Fundraising Megalator, as there's a link there to the fundraising code there are some webinar videos uh, again of 10 to 15 minutes long some of them are aimed at trustees uh, so some fantastic resources available from them as well parish resources there's a link to their trusteeship section that includes a short video uh, on trusteeship in in churches and also uh, a link to download a fit and proper persons form and then at the bottom there is the guidance to the uh, Church of England's uh, uh, web pages with uh, two documents, a guide, uh, guidance on the fundraising code uh, from a Church of England perspective and a guide for churches on vulnerable persons. So some really useful resources uh, there uh, for you to access. Now, the, this is one of the videos from the fundraising regulator. As I mentioned, there is one about trustee responsibilities. Seeing that we're just past uh, 10 past three, and I know I need to be finishing in good time to allow you to go off and have your brew uh, before we come back in at half past three. I'm not going to play that today. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask, see if any of you got any questions or queries. So I'm going to stop sharing. So I can see you, well, sort of see you all. Um, 
So uh, either um, unmute yourselves. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording. Uh, I, I think I'll probably use this recording because um, uh, there was uh, a, a, a specific church issue that was raised in my previous workshop.